My name's Eric Schatzker of Bloomberg Television. I've been looking forward to this panel for weeks. Many of you know there are few more authoritative views on the use of credit than the people here with me on the stage today. <clears throat> to my far left, John Sokoloff of Leonard Green and Partners. To my immediate left, we have Josh Harris of Apollo Management. To my right, Josh, uh, no, Kerry Lathrop of Citigroup. And to my far right, Josh Friedman of Canyon Partners. Gentlemen, thank you very much for doing this. The folks at the Milken Institute are superb at giving panels intriguing names, and the alchemy of capital structure is certainly no exception. Alchemy, of course, is the medieval art of turning lead into gold. So far as I'm aware, nobody ever succeeded in doing that. But alchemy in credit is real. Debt and leverage can make companies better. So I'll begin today's conversation with a simple question for our panel. Why is capital structure so important? Josh Harris. Well, I mean, capital structure allows a company to uh, have flexibility to grow and prosper. So um, yeah, I think if you set it up in a good way, uh, it also uh, is a significant cost. Uh, so it's really, um, you know, kind of, and then it, it allows for uh, leverage, which allows for greater uh, returns if it's used a, a properly. So I'd say that, um, you know, capital structure, if you set it up well, can be a real asset. Uh, it's the whole, uh, most companies um, focus on the, the left side of the balance sheet, the asset side of the balance sheet. But really, when you think about creating value uh, for the equity or for securities, you have to focus on both sides, the left and the right. And actually, Apollo, um, you know, one of the things that we're known for is um, buying good companies with bad balance sheets. And so there's definitely lots of great companies over the years that have been really, really fantastic companies with great strategies, great assets, great management, but they set up the right side of the balance sheet uh, in a way that wasn't appropriate for their volatility, and so they ended up getting in trouble. And for that reason, uh, really, the company itself was hurt. And in some cases, uh, the company itself can be destroyed if uh, capital structure isn't handled well. What are some good examples of bad capital structure? I would say that um, one of the great undervalued assets in the capital markets generally, or misvalued assets historically, is, is the value of optionality. And I think a lot of the panelists here, uh, like John and Josh, for example, understood long ago that if you leverage a balance sheet, the equity has great optionality as long as the debt's long enough and safe enough and you can survive it. And you have a lot of opportunities to get, get lucky. And when you have unbounded opportunity on the upside and bounded opportunity on the downside, that's a great thing. And I remember one of the very first transactions I worked on back at Drexel in 19, 84 or 85 uh, with Mike was, was a, a leveraged buyout of Motel 6 for KKR. And George Roberts said, if the capital structure is, if the debt is long, luck will follow. And, and I think that's a truism. And so part of the game is to try to look for situations where you might have a lot longer bet Im implicit than what the securities imply. So the, the trick is to try to find balance sheets where um, securities where that optionality is severely undervalued. Debt security is inherently negative optionality, so which is why we like to find distressed things or things where there's much more, much more upside per unit of downside than there is in par debt, where you basically, if you're lucky, you get your money back. John. Well, I think uh, you know three of us on the panel were fortunate enough to learn our trade at the desk of Mike Milken 30 years ago, and we learned uh, at a very. Young I worked for John and Josh, by right. the way. I'd like to point out. Right. So you know, <coughs> and and we saw some great actors and some bad actors, but we were taught very early that the balance sheet is your friend, and the balance sheet as an issuer should be actively managed to enhance your equity returns and. Uh, and there's times to issue equity, there's times to buy in equity, there's times to issue debt, there's times to buy in debt. So a lot of folks view the balance sheet as relatively static, but as Josh said, that side of the balance sheet provides sometimes more opportunities to create value. And we saw, so when Drexel went down and the, and, and the tide went out, it was a, a time of great carnage and great opportunity uh, in the 89, 90, 91, and some fortunes were lost and some great fortunes were, were made and firms were launched like three on this panel. So it was a time of where active balance sheet management and, and using the tools we had been taught by Mike and others proved to be uh, a real advantage um, and a differentiator in the corporate world.
Kerry, these guys come at it from either the investor side or the issuer side, the sponsor side. You come at it from the trading side, if you will. Do you view it any differently? Um, no, I, I think it's you know, it's the same view. I you know, you know, to me, I think you know, I think Josh touched on it, or Josh Harris touched on it. <laughs> I think one of the tensions is that you know, the, is the cost of creating you know that duration or flexibility, and if, you know, kind of if you look back, probably over our careers, you know, I think. Uh, companies that miscalculate or I think, you know, you, you know, to me, I always, when I look at a company, I try to think about is there advantage on the asset side of the balance sheet or the liability side of the balance sheet? And I think oftentimes, you know, when you get into, you know, go through a cycle, people kind of stray and lose sight of that. And I think, you know, whether it's, you know, ending up short funding or not when the market's open, taking enough liquidity out of the market to maintain that optionality. So I don't, I don't think it's, any different view from a you know a trading perspective? Three of you have pointed out that you worked for Michael Milken. Kerry, you've been doing this for decades as well. I can't resist the temptation to turn this into a little bit of a history lesson, given that, as I say, three of you worked for Mike. We might consider him the godfather of modern capital structure. He revolutionized the industry uh, and the implications of what he created at Drexel is something that we're still, that's still evolving. Um, how has the thinking, John, maybe I'll come back to you to start this. How has the thinking about debt, leverage, capital structure, generally speaking, evolved since your time at Drexel in the 1980s? And then specifically, let's look at how things have changed in the post-crisis environment with the move towards zero interest rates, the reach for yield, etc. Well, I think it's, it's, you know, we're a private equity firm, so we're a, a net issuer of, of debt securities, equity securities, et cetera. Uh, but I think generally in the C-suite, in the boardroom 30 years ago, and to some extent today even, debt is a bad word. And, and see, many CEOs do, not, do not, not like debt. It has a negative connotation. I don't need debt. I'm debt-free, people say with great pride. And, and we were kind of taught that debt can be your friend and a great tool to use in your, in your C-suite and, and in your balance sheet. But you know, in the 80s when we learned our trade, there was some tricky debt out there. And some debt was your friend and some was really your enemy that ate you alive because we were issuing securities sometimes at 12, 14, 15% and they had amortization and they had covenants and they had all kinds of bad triggers and bank debt was high single digit to 10%. So it was a tricky time. We would kind of carefully manipulate the LBO model in the 80s to try to get an uh, EBITDA to interest coverage ratio of one and a half times. This is on Lotus 1, 2, 3. And if you got there, you felt, whoa, this is a safe credit now. Well, none of us would ever do a deal today at one and a half times EBITDA to interest coverage. So, so the technology in our world has, has um, evolved dramatically. And for those of us that learned our trade with double-digit interest rates, the interest rates we have today are somewhat of a, of a fantasy. It's almost like alchemy. You've turned high rates into low rates, where we used to borrow money at 15%. Now we're borrowing money at 5%. We just have a comfort level today that is so dramatically different than we did 25 and 30 years ago. So when we pitch debt today to companies, we try to tell them, hey, you don't understand you're living in this unbelievable golden time of issuing debt with rates where it's very hard to get into trouble. And I think there's more receptivity today to, to making proposals to executives. Uh, 20, 30 years ago was, was much tougher. So, so what Mike and Drexel did was, uh, they, they, before Mike and Drexel, there was bank debt, and there was an aggressive investment grade bond. So if you were one of the biggest companies in the world, you could issue bonds. And there was equity. And what Mike noticed was that there was this whole middle part of the capital structure that um, was not being utilized. And, and many, many uh, emerging companies, um, smaller issuers, couldn't, um, couldn't find leverage other than from the banks. And so uh, the high yield market, which, as John mentioned, was used to be called the junk bond market because that was a derogatory term was born um, and, you know, from probably the late 70s to 1990, Drexel had, you know, the largest market share in that market. In 1990, um, <clears throat> the government decided that uh, junk bonds were bad and so they made it very difficult for savings and loans and insurance companies to hold junk bonds. And so the entire market fell apart and Drexel itself uh, 
went bankrupt in 1990. And then, um, you know, Apollo at that point was born uh, to, in essence, facilitate the refinancing of, and, and, and some other firms, by the way, uh, Oak Tree, uh, Josh's firm, was born to facilitate the deleveraging of, um, uh, of the companies that, that had been financed by the high yield market. And so uh, distress for control today is a, is a kind of a nomenclature that everyone knows. Uh, you go out instead of um, you know kind of putting up equity and borrowing from the markets, you buy a company that's a very good company. In our case, the, probably the best example was Lyondell Chemical, which now is a 50, 60, 70 billion dollar market cap company, where the debt had traded down to very distressed levels, and so you buy debt and you deleverage it instead of leveraging, instead of raising it, but you end up in the same place with a a good company and a well-structured capital structure. And so Apollo, in, in those early days, as well as a few others, uh, we made our name buying a lot of great companies, um, you know, whether, whether it be uh, Lane, Broil, Thomasville Furniture, uh, Samsonite Luggage, Culligan Water System, Converse Shoes, and Vail Ski Resorts. And that, and, and hence, like, that, that market was born. And so um, that's a bit of the history lesson today. Uh, at zero rates, the temptation for everyone is to borrow too much um, because at zero rates, it doesn't cost very much and those EBITDA to interest um, you know, kind of ratios look really good. But the problem is when rates go up, you got to pay it back. And so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real problem and you need to be very uh, conservative about how you think about uh, terminal value, how you think about um, the ability of, co of a company not just to pay its interest, but also to pay its principal at the end of the day. The other thing is today, um, what you should be doing as a sponsor or an issuer is you should be refinancing and pushing out maturities and you know, really being intelligent about setting up a capital structure that creates that long dated option that, uh, that John talked about. I mean, one, you know, one of the things you touched on was negative rates or even if you think about zero rates and what's that done? I mean, you know, you can think about, you know, Europe, for example, where you have the, uh, if you look at the investment grade market, the investment grade market in Europe yields 130. You know, the high yield market, it's, I don't even know if you can call it a high yield market, it's a high spread market, it's about 435. So, you know, what's happened and I think with flexibility that um, borrowers or sponsors have gotten is that people have gotten squeezed into high yield. So I think it's created an incredible environment for companies too if they want to lengthen out maturities and probably up until the last six or nine months, the market's been kind of wide open and very, very uh, accessible and willing to provide rescue financing. Again, I think there's been some changes recently, but I think overall, and again, I think that window's probably closed for some companies, but I think for the vast majority, there's still access and ability to, you know, kind of protect, you know, or fortify your balance sheet as you get kind of later in the, in the cycle. Just, um, I just wanted to jump in with a couple of things there. Um, you don't always have to pay it back. You can figure out something else to do, um, which is when all the fun starts. Um, we all know that. We can talk about that later. Um, yeah, much later. But, uh, <laughs> but we'll start with, uh, you asked Eric earlier, what makes a bad balance sheet? Government policy has a unique ability to create bad balance sheets. If you look at the housing crisis, it's not like government sat there with clean hands and didn't have a role in creating really bad balance sheets across an enormous asset class. And it's a, it's a bit of what's happening again today, and we're talking about the history of the high yield market, and Josh and John were talking about how in the old days you had bank debt and you had equity and maybe there was some subordinated debt that some insurance company negotiated privately. Then you had a more liquid market and so forth. Well, now you've got a situation with negative interest rates where some guy uh, is working for a living and he says, geez, uh, you know, stock market multiples are really high. I'm scared about that. Well, maybe that's driven by low rates. I, I think I'll buy bonds and the most attractive market in the world right now in terms of just yields. You look at European rates, you look at treasury rates, you look at IG rates, all of a sudden high yield looks pretty good at 740 or whatever the yield is this morning on the high yield index. And of course, um, that masks a lot of significant issues that create really bad balance sheets. So now you have an explosion of ETFs and mutual funds that are buying high yield bonds because everybody wants that yield so desperately. The only problem is um, government policy has also created a situation where commercial banks and investment banks, guys like my friend Kerry here, no longer can devote a significant portion of their capital to making markets. 
And so liquidity is basically pretty terrible if you really need to sell something overnight. So someone doesn't think he's taking a lot of risk because he's earning a nice yield, and then all of a sudden, uh, there's a few redemptions at the fund, or maybe they have to reshuffle their index because some high-grade bonds got downgraded, and now they're part of the investment-grade index. And all of a sudden, you have really significant capital losses. And, and I worry that, that the structure of the market today is one with a lot of very mismatched capital structures. And if you have a mismatched capital structure in the corporate sense, the assets don't work out so well, uh, the liabilities are coming due, something bad's happening, there's a, there's a pattern for how you renegotiate that that works pretty well and, 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 and f the company can have another life if the business is okay. That doesn't work as well in other contexts. But I, I would argue that's what creates an opportunity if you have the right kind of liability structure as an investor. And that is one thing, you know, we're seeing more and it'd be interesting to hear the three of you, you know, if you're kind of, you're kind of moving down this path also, but just having more longer term locked up money because you know, if you think about what happened even in the CLO market earlier this year, you had, you know, AAA buyers who had bought a uh, product on leverage that were forced sellers. You had uh, junior MES buyers uh, who had terrible 2015s. And when 2016 started out poorly, there was fear of uh, forced liquidations. So, yeah, there was some fundamental reasons why liabilities got beaten down, but there was a large technical element. And if you have the right balance sheet and, you know, who do you typically see stepping in, you know, it could be insurance companies, pensions, endowments, someone who could live with the mark-to-market -market volatility. It, it gives you an ability to be a buyer when, you know, there are four sellers. A, a, a perfect example of what Josh was talking about is the energy markets. So the energy markets drove the development of the shale. If you look at it, uh, energy used to be you know, 5% of the high yield market sort of fast forward, you know, five or seven years and it's 18% of the high yield market. And really the, um, the risk that people were taking um, got lost in the wash a bit. People really didn't understand how volatile the companies were um, and they were looking for yield. And so- Should they, that have been equity financing? It, you know, in, in retrospect, of course it should have. Um, the, you know, it's a very capital intensive business. Um, the assets are very hard to understand from a financial statement. You need real geologic and engineering talent to understand them. And yet the high yield market was indiscriminately financing all these companies. And ultimately, price of oil fell. And it's a commodity, right? The price of oil goes up, it goes down. It's unpredictable. And now, um, you know, the, the, the country and the economy and the energy markets have a problem. And so, um, that's, a, that's an example of a mis mismatched capital structure. And I think for, for a long time from here, we're going to be working out a number of companies. That, that yeah, raises, I, say, I, I, think a, I think a lot of uh, companies, CEOs, CFOs, sometimes focus on the wrong thing when issuing debt securities. And it's almost, uh, you know, they just want to know what's the rate. And it's a macho thing if they get a lower rate than their friend or the spread over this. And, what we were taught early is, is the rate is, is sometimes, you know, not that important. You know, what's the maturity? Buy more time. Uh, have optionality. The, some of the firms that have made it through the, the tough times in 1990 and 2000 and 2008 are when they didn't have maturity. So if it's an extra 50 or 100 basis points for another couple, three years of maturity with no covenants, you know, we pay that every day. And other people get upset about eighths and quarters. I mean, you're, there are a lot of these strange converts that have been issued the past few years where there's no coupon, 50% premium, it's kind of, un that's really alchemy, that's kind of unintelligible, and, and, and companies issue them all day, but a lot of them are five-year maturities, and they do mature, and if your stock is down when they mature, it's a real time bomb. So, so you know, buy flexibility, pay a little bit extra, and, and make sure whatever storm comes, you can live through the storm is something that, that we employ and I think we were all taught at a young age. I think the sense we're getting in the room here is that the storm is coming. When? Right? Where are we? I, I don't know how you prefer to, you know, characterize it, whether it's innings of a baseball game or hands on a clock. What does it look like? Well, you, you've had a pretty monstrous bounce in the high yield market in the last, call it, 8 to 12 weeks from a, a point where the indices looked really wide to where they looked quite a bit tighter. What that masks is a bunch of danger, which is why you have to really look 
it's more of a security pickers market right now, and the dangers are at both ends of the high yield market. The, the average yield may be in the low sevens, but almost nothing lives in the low sevens. If you look at it, there's a whole bunch of stuff yielding four to six percent. You've got interest rate risk, you've got spread risk, and you've got the odd piece of credit risk. And when you add them together, it can be a really dangerous neighborhood to live in if you own that subset of the market. At the other end, you have a whole slew of stuff that's trading at 15 to 25 percent yield, some of which the yield is, is illusory because it's clear you're not getting paid back, and other which is, is quite interesting. But it, it's, very, it's very bifurcated. Some, we, we, we've seen how extreme the downside can be if you get it wrong on some of those more junior, very low dollar price pieces of paper. So, so I think that the idea that, ah, this index is, is yielding 400 basis points more than all these other ones, therefore this is really safe, no worries. Um, maybe I'll hedge a little bit of it with, with rates. Um, is probably not a, good, not a good way to play. Um, there are a lot of things that can, ca that can be catalysts, um, but I'll, I'll, I, I've used enough time, I'll let others talk about them, but I think oil, you'll see what happens at the end of the year when, when to, the, to the transmission companies and some of those balance sheets. Uh, you'll see what happens to some of these companies that are almost IG type uh, rates that they're paying, but that have relevered to points that, that give them the lowest interest coverages that we've seen in five or six or seven years. You, and, and the macro economy is clearly showing slower growth, clearly in many, many areas, and yet leverage is, is really, really rather high, and interest coverage is rather low. So it seems inevitable that there's going to be some correction in, in, in those broad indices. If you Plus, think I think, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I think you, a lot of the known unknowns, you know, whether it's coming up, you have things like Brexit, um, you know, Greece is still not resolved. China's kind of been probably, you know, somewhat, you know, pushed to the side, but again, you still have, uh, the risk if Fed uh, looks like they're going to increase rates, China comes back into play, plus keep an eye, you're seeing an increase in defaults in the local market there to see how that uh, spills to, uh, you know, to potentially external markets. Um, there are a number of factors. You have the U.S. election, and I think what was interesting, if you look at kind of the correction that we had last August, the first time that um, China encountered volatility, you know, when you looked at kind of how assets rallied at the end of last year, um, you had equities rally, you had the high end of credit, you know, called investment grade rally. But I thought what was really notable was that the low end of credit, you know, stressed, you know, high yield or distressed, continued selling off. And I think that was probably the first time since the financial crisis that you didn't have this risk on, risk off movement. And I think credit's really been the bear market since July 2014. And I think what credit markets have been doing is really uh, coming to the realization that we're going to be in a low growth, low inflation environment for a prolonged period of time and what companies are not going to be able to grow into their balance sheet or delever. And that's why I think you've seen this real dispersion that Josh was talking about, um, where, you know, whatever, 20 or 30 percent of the market trades below five and a quarter and close to 20 percent trades above 11 and a quarter. And, you know, I think the, um, you know, like I said, the challenge is even with the recent rally in the last couple of months, it's not like every company has access again. If you looked at really what kind of issuance you've seen, it's been very much double B dominated. You know, it's clearly moving down the credit spectrum, but not every company has access, and I don't think not every company will regain access. I think, you know, as investors have kind of gotten burned and are working through, you know, the problems in their portfolio, I think there's a psychological impact that, um, you know, that they deal with, and they're just much more defensive. You know, equity investors, you know, can have a few things go to zero and then find that thing that goes up five or ten times and make up for it. Debt investors don't have that benefit. So I think it is a, we are late cycle, whether you want to use it the clock, you know, I think you're getting close to nine o'clock or, you know, late in the innings of the game. And this is the time that while markets are still open, you know, I would, I think it's a great time, you know, to term out debt and, you know, fortify your balance sheet. You know, I will say, like, it all, you have to start with the macro. It all starts with the fact that 70 to 75% of the world has negative real rates. And so that kind of, that kind of sets the backdrop for everything else. And so, you know, whether it be um, the equity markets, whether it be the high yield market, whether it be, um, you know, all the fixed income markets, even the private equity market, which the average multiple paid for a company now is over 11 times. Uh, EBITDA, that's the absolute peak in the private equity market ever. So all this stuff stems from the fact that people, like big institutions, individuals, no one has any place to put their money, so people are chasing yield. And what you saw between November and February was 
Really nothing. I mean, China certainly, you know, maybe made some policy mistakes. The price of oil was down. Uh, but the there was no, no real change in the fundamentals, and yet the market just sold off big time because people's view, because everyone, all of us know that, that all these markets are overvalued, stemming from, you know, really government policy. And so the minute that there is even the slightest hint that things might go wrong, people, like, shoot first and ask questions later. They drive the markets down. And, and, and what you saw in February, in March and April was, you know, the wall of money came back in, you know, QE kept going, and it overwhelmed the risk. So what you really have, it's a very treacherous time to invest. Uh, risk is being mis there is no real, uh, risk is being mispriced uh, uh, by, you know, a lot of stemming from the government policies and the, the easy money. And um, as an investor, um, you know, you, it's very, very treacherous. As an issuer, obviously, it's time to take advantage of it. But, you know, the bar is open. That doesn't mean you should have five drinks. You know, you need to have one drink and go home and take an aspirin and go to sleep. Um, and so, you know, we all have to be very careful right now. And I will say, even triple C is a rallying. I mean, you, yeah. you say that yeah, for a month or two, um, the markets got tough, but you're now seeing you know, distressed and triple C's and energy credit and everything is kind of coming back. So, um, you know, you, again, you know, the market is vacillating, you know, between, um, you know, huge risk on and huge risk off. And um, it's really a, a battle between the fundamentals, which are somewhat late, late cycle and treacherous, and the technicals, which is massive amounts of money with no place to go. John, are you okay. having one drink or five? What's that? You having one drink or five? I didn't hear you. Are you having one drink or five? Five. Well, look, at, I, I, I think uh, I'm not a big drinker anyway, but uh, <laughs> maybe should be. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, look, whenever you're six or seven years into an economic expansion, uh, all of our alarms are going off and, and we're watching and we've had these wonderfully receptive uh, both equity and debt markets to issuers. And so whenever you do a new transaction today, as for your balance sheet, you have to plan that during the next five or 10 years, you're going to be going through some type of downturn. You have to build that into your models. Now, generally, we don't think it will be as rough as the downturn of 2008 and 2009, because that was an 80-year storm. Um, and, and, but, you know, we, look, at, we've been waiting for rates to go up for a long time. We have spent tens and tens of millions of dollars on caps and swaps and everything planning for rates going up, and we could have held a bonfire with the money because it's all been wasted, but we still do it out of a sense of caution and, and, and but, you know, but look, at, we have a heavy consumer-focused portfolio in the United States. We keep looking for signs of slowdown because the press is so negative, and by the way, our view is things are okay out there. We're not really exposed to energy, uh, but uh, retail services, healthcare, are actually doing okay, but we're still worried, you know, we're still cautious, and our view today is, again, borrow, you know, again, the debt today is not our father's debt. If we can borrow six to seven times EBITDA at six to seven percent interest rates with no covenants, no amortizations, borrow every nickel you can, as long as you believe you have a fundamentally strong underlying performance at the issuer, and that when maturities come, you're EBITDA will be higher than it is today. So that, in our view, is almost like shorting the credit market by issuing all this debt. And by the way, if, if the debt comes down and your performance is doing well, you buy in the debt. So, so the, the crunch that came into leveraged credit markets in January, February was, was swift, it was dramatic, and there was tremendous carnage you know, caused, as they say, by energy and supply. It wasn't really as credit-driven. So we we're like, oh my gosh, but you have to respond. So what did we do? Well, we, we, we turned from being an investor in equities to an investor in debt. So we're a private equity fund, but we found equity-like returns in credit instruments. So in January and February, we invested only in debt. Uh, of other companies, as well as for our own companies, we bought in a bunch of debt because the market overreacts. Because the leveraged credit markets are kind of fickle, emotional, dramatic in their reactions on the upside and downside, all of which creates opportunity. So we're cautious, but you know the markets are your friend. And right now, if you know, for some of our companies, we're doing new deals. Credit still abundant. We're issuing all we can. I think there's a limit to what QE can do. Um, and you know, right now, you know, QE is driving the market, um, and QE outside the U.S. 
uh, and, and what the Fed does or doesn't do is going to have a big impact on the market. And what you're seeing in, in Japan and what you're seeing, Japan for the first time um, uh, went negative rates and, did, and sort of announced big programs and the yen strengthened and the stock market fell. Um, Europe, um, the effectiveness of QE is, is waning. Uh, you know, just statistically, it's not working as well as it did. And the real question is, um, when the, effic the efficacy of, the, of QE runs out and people are staring at, you know, kind of a stock market with really high valuation, fixed income credit markets with really low rates, um, and, and QE that's no longer working and very slow fundamentals, what happens to terminal value? If you borrow six to seven times EBITDA, uh, it better be the case that you can sell at 10 times EBITDA if you bought it 10 times EBITDA. So, you know, the, the other implicit bet that you're making is that you can sell at a very high price. Uh, if, you, if you buy at 10 times EBITDA and you borrow at 6% and you sell at 8 times EBITDA and you grow at 5%, you've lost money for your investors. And so, um, you know, it, it's the, the other bet that you're making is that terminal valuations are appropriate in a really slow growth environment. And I really... You know, I, I question or we question whether that's the case and what really happens when the efficacy of QE goes away. And it's really starting to look like you're heading in that direction. So, Josh Friedman, if investors are becoming more disciplined, what is doable? Let's go back to the capital structure question. What is doable? What, you're an investor. What are you willing to buy into? What kind of structure is feasible today? Well, first of all, I think you have to be, as an investor, acutely sensitive to what's going on around you. Who's buying? Who's selling? Why are they buying? Why are they selling? If you looked at the beginning of this year, the end of last year, you know, I think the first four months, first three months of this year, two and a half months, through February 11th, there were about four billion of outflows in high-yield mutual funds. And not surprisingly, prices got killed. They had almost nothing to do with fundamentals. Uh, following February 11th, everyone decided that oil was going up and 15 billion of capital came into those funds. So everybody was buying. And you go, why is this debt trading here at this time and is trading here at this time? Is, are things that different at you pick the company? Not really. So fundamentals aren't always being attached to the pricing of securities. And the reason is that when you get the kind of flows that those things imply um, in, a, in an illiquid market, and you're in a much less liquid market, A, you better make sure you have the right capital structure to handle it, um, uh, and B, y you want to know who's selling and who's buying, why, and is that creating a price opportunity that's way out of whack with the risk return. So today, that means that you, you have to be relatively quick to react to things. You have to be able to move into fairly specialized markets when they get thrown out with the bathwater, whether that's the CLO tranche market or whether that's um, you know, non-performing loans or whether that's some other type of specialized paper that all of a sudden got, got battered around by this paper. Um, I also think the regulatory structure has created a situation where there are many, many places in the markets where banks used to be more active, and the capital costs associated with those banks have now gotten to be really, really punitive. You take commercial real estate lending as a, as a good example. Um, banks are more than happy to lend to you at 3 or 3.5% three if you fit into the box of what the bank does. But if there's one check mark you can't check off, even though it's a great loan, they simply say no. They don't say, well, we'll do a loan, but we'll charge you 5% or 6 or 7 or even 8 or 9 or 10. So you try to find things that have complexity to it that, that don't fit into one of the... Capital markets are very segmented. People, high yield index funds can only buy what's in the high yield index. You know, um, oil and gas funds can only buy what's in oil and gas. So you try to find things where, where people's mandate forces them to be buyers or sellers, or not to be buyers or sellers, because um, those are the places where you can get way overcompensated for the fundamental risks and then wait it out. I think it's very hard to find places to put your money in the opportunistic world. So if you're a distressed player or, uh, you know, to a certain extent private equity, um, you know, you, you, you have to look at really uh, specific areas where there's carnage. And so the energy market certainly um, is an area that, and by the way, it's not for the faint of heart, it's, it's treacherous. 
you have to have special expertise, but there's, you know, there's some value to be had there. Um, I think prices have rallied way too much. Um, but, uh, you know, they're volatile. They go up and down, and, you know, you need to play across the capital st stack and look very specifically for opportunities. I think financial services in Europe where, you know, the, the regulatory climate and in the U.S. to a lesser extent is just, you know, banging on the banks. There's just lots of businesses kind of coming out that uh, due to, you know, all the regulatory changes that are going on are... Are, are better being in non-bank structures. And so there's, there's opportunities there. And then I think the biggest opportunity, truthfully, is, um, you know, also relates to the banks just getting out of more investment-grade investment credit, whether it be, you know, CLOs, structured credit, um, illiquid investment-grade credit, insurance-linked liabilities, so which is really not the um, 10 to 15 percent business. It's really the 5 to 10 percent business. And so to me, um, you know, you can intelligently today make two to three to 400 base points excess return, you know, in, in the sort of double B, triple B, you know, kind of area, that crossover area. The opportunity business, the distress business, uh, really hard other than specific specific uh, situations. And uh, truthfully, when the markets pulled back, I mean, all of us that do this for a living, um, it was hard to buy anything. The markets were incredibly illiquid. Um, yeah, we tried to buy a lot. We bought some. Um, and so we, we, we would have needed, and I think all of us would have needed, a more sustained you know, downturn. It was just getting interesting. Uh, it was led down by energy. And then you were just getting to the point where on a broad-based sit, uh, situation, industrials were getting cheap. And we were starting to buy a lot. And then, boop, wall of money hit it, and it went right back. And so we you know, put some money out, but uh, really uh, ended up doing a lot of private equity transactions because sellers got a little more realistic in the financing markets that collapsed. But that's what I would say. Look, okay, in, in our world, it's, it's always challenging to invest. We've been in a, a low GDP, very low single-digit growth environment, low rate, zero inflation for, for many years. How do you invest in that market? So we kind of have, have two strategies. I mean, generally, we try to find companies that are just going to dramatically outgrow the GDP. Uh, and, and that's our fundamental philosophy in investing. And we'll pay up for them, and we'll pay 10, 11 times EBITDA. A lot of people don't like to hear that, but we do pay them. Now, if you're right on the growth, that within two or three years, all of a sudden you own it at six or seven times EBITDA, and you feel much better. If you pay a big price and you're wrong on the growth, you're kind of dead. You have refinancing risk, you'll have terminal value risk, and it, and it, it doesn't end well. You know, we, we wish we were better at buying stuff cheap. We try to buy stuff at lower multiples. We're not that good at it. Occasionally, the public markets or the high yield markets will have irrational dislocations and give us time to pounce, which kind of Mike Milken taught us. So in 2008, we made a huge investment in Whole Foods at that time. A couple, three years ago, we made a large investment in Activision, where we just felt the stock was so fundamentally undervalued, and the stock has, uh, we benefited in those situations from both growth and multiple expansion. So those are kind of outliers, exceptions you have to pounce on, but, but fundamentally for us to invest our capital in this tough environment is to just look hard and find the growth. And there are sectors in the services area, food, experiential, healthcare, that are growing 10, 15% today. And, uh, and, that, and that's where we're, we're putting our money and, and borrowing every nickel we can along the way. Josh, you mentioned that I guess valuations became attractive enough that you did some private equity, uh, but you also became an issuer, right, in the process of doing the ADT transaction, yep. you did uh, regional care capella yep. and fresh market. What was your experience like in these credit markets as an issuer? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that we did, and, and we did, we completed a number of transactions and, and uh, a couple others as well, a hospital company and, you know, hopefully uh, an education company, we'll see, um, is we, we had to um, redo the capital structures to get the deals done. Um, you know, we went to Coke Industry, you know, the, the ADT transaction, which was a $15 billion deal with $10 billion of refinancing. We, uh, we made it investment grade. Uh, we rolled the bonds. We went to Coke Industries. Uh, a big LP of ours stepped up and bought a lot of the debt. So when you, we pared the debt down to, we were only selling really two or three billion of debt. By the time we got done with all of those things and private placements, we only, and, and that was enough that the banks were willing to 
um, to bridge it, uh, even though uh, it was a difficult time. They felt very, very comfortable with that credit. And so, um, you know, the, and in, in all these cases, we're announcing a deal today, actually. Uh, in the industrial space, we had to lower the leverage multiples. But when you do that, um, in many cases, you're able to also renegotiate price. And in, in some cases, we did that uh, in those transactions. And so there was, there's a sharing of the, the pain. And the reality is when you put more equity in, returns go down. Uh, it's a safer company. But um, ultimately, we, we in private equity are all uh, slaves to that 20% uh, plus return hurdle. And so I think the way it worked out for us in the latest dip was, was good in the sense that we got safer, more deleveraged companies um, at, um, you know, at, at sort of lower prices and maybe held the returns close to the same. And you know, it, interestingly, when the other thing that happens is when you finance into those types of markets, the, the terms the banks are willing to bridge the deal on are very onerous, and you take risk. Um, if things go the wrong way, you can be forced into the market. Um, you can have onerous covenants. You can end up with all the non-optionality things that John talked about, that you can have short-term capital structures. They can move around the debt in different ways. And I think so far, uh, we've been lucky enough to have bridged the transactions going into a difficult climate, but then the financings themselves have gone quite well. ADT itself was you know, wildly oversubscribed, and the rates that we ended up getting were... Um, you know, several hundred basis points below our base case model. Not that, you know, that sometimes, you know, luck is, you know, it was luck. We, the week that we were in the market was, was a good week. And so um, in some cases, a lot of people say, well, when rates go up, what happens to private equity? It's bad, things dry up. And that is true to a certain extent, but longer run and medium term, it's better. Because at the end of the day, it drives pricing down um, and pricing ultimately is permanent. Uh, capital structure is temporary. Like you can get a great capital structure, but ultimately it matures. So really, it's about uh, reconciling the price you pay with the cost of debt and the amount of leverage you get. And for us, in this case, it it turned out okay. Kerry, is what Josh describes about the deals Apollo has been involved with recently broadly representative of, of what you've seen? Um, yeah, I, as I was saying, I think you know the market um, you know has had a dramatic change in the last couple months, and you know has clearly you know, been open to, uh, you know, like I said, is moving down to the, uh, the risk spectrum. But I think, as Josh said, is like you have to be flexible, you know, to either delever or accommodate what, uh, you know, the sentiment of investors are. And as a, as, as what, what about said, the flexibility of terms? You know, one of the dominant features of sort of the past decade, right, is the erosion of covenants once maybe once upon a time sacrosanct, not so much any longer. You know, Where do we stand on that? You know, I think, again, that speaks to, I think, just the technicals. And, you know, there's probably if there's anything that probably investors complain about the most is the lack of ability to, uh, you know, impose or, you know, covenants. And the hard thing is, you know, when the deal's five times oversubscribed, you can be like, okay, I'm going to drop because I don't like the terms. And, you know, there's, you know, five other people who are waiting for your bond. So I think it's, again, it's great for borrowers. It pushes off, you know, the likelihood or the timing of defaults, you know, probably means recoveries are lower ultimately when there are defaults. But again, I think that's just a function of, you know, kind of the environment where we've been in, somewhat driven by as we've touched on QE. But I think it's just natural when you're late in the cycle to see, you know, an erosion of, uh, of investor protection. Because the leverage is clearly, you know, like I said, it's shifting a little, but still with, uh, with the borrowers rather than investors. It's unclear whether having covenants, you know, in big issuers with broad-based syndicate. It used to be that the banks, it was a club of, of, of banks and, you know, it was relationship banks. They knew these companies well. Um, and um, certainly from an issuer standpoint, not having covenants is a good thing. Uh, from an investor standpoint, I think it's unclear whether certainly having covenants, there's a great debate. Um, you know, investors, some investors will argue that, uh, they want a seat at the table, but now these are broadly syndicated institutional markets with, you know, sometimes hundreds of players. And so, uh, you know, if a company's not doing well, if it's a good company that happens to trip a covenant, largely these things end up being um, 
ways of getting concessions on rate, fees, and other things. I don't necessarily believe there was a study done by S&P that it necessarily is better for investors to have covenants. It creates early distress in many cases um, in, in situations where the, the company might have worked through it. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a debatable point, and you can, I've heard lots of different people come out on different sides. It's unclear to me that it's, it's valuable to either investors or issuers. Um, certainly in certain situations, it's valuable to have an early warning system, but in other situations, you might have a company that goes into bankruptcy and is really distressed uh, and racks up lots of legal costs uh, and is forced to do things it might not otherwise do uh, because of the covenants. Uh, look, covenants count. I mean, there's no question in my mind that covenants count. And um, we get into all sorts of situations every day of the week on, on the distress situation that we have in our portfolio at Canyon where we have to, you know, look at covenants. Sometimes the issuer has a different interpretation of the covenants and, you know, it becomes an interesting contest. But there's no question that if you didn't have a covenant there, you'd be in substantially worse shape. Sometimes that's actually okay because we get to enter something at a really low price because the last guy wasn't thinking about the covenants. Or we're stuck with something where we say, geez, I wish we had had this covenant because we expected the issuer to behave in a way that they didn't behave in. But the covenant thing is very much driven by supply and demand in the market. There's no, no question. What's kind of interesting is even with this big run-up over the last eight weeks, we found that in a number of the new issues, there's actually uh, been a significant ability to negotiate if we're willing to take a big block in an issue, uh, significant covenant protection that, I, that seems inconsistent with the pricing that's existing in the market right now. Maybe that's a little bit of a lag phenomenon from the first quarter, I'm not sure, but it's definitely the case. And um, so, it's, look, it, it, it's an issue that, that people have to worry about. Um, bank debt, you know, you see covenant light transactions, and, and owning lots of covenant light transactions just puts you in a position where you have negative optionality, period. You, there's nothing good that can happen to you other than you get paid back. So you need to have protections that make awfully sure you're going to get paid back, and maybe that you're even going to get paid back early with a premium because there's something valuable in that to the issuer. So covenants are part of that whole package of maturity and call protection and everything else. It's quite important. John is the, is the guy who's willing to pay more and, and maybe... <laughs> 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 Look, I, I, I think uh, covenants are one thing, uh, you know, indenture uh, language and, and layering of, uh, of securities and, and dead end moving stuff around is, is a whole other issue. Yeah. I think it's very unclear if covenants help the lender. Uh, I, I, I think, as, as was described, as we used to want to have relationship lenders. We knew our lenders. Uh, they, they'd loan us money, they'd hold the money if you had a problem, call us up, we'll work it out. Well, that was never a lot of fun, by the way, to call Now you have to call Josh. To work it out. But now, you know, there's hundreds of holders. You don't know who to call. Uh, it's chaos if you ever have to get them together. Uh, they have advisors, they have CLOs. It's, it's, it's difficult. Um, so it, it, the beauty of Covenant Light is there's really two major points, uh, two obligations in your contract with your lender over the life of the loan, which is to pay them their interest on time and to pay them their money back when it matures. So that's really your only two requirements. Uh, and if you can pull those off, there's really no reason to even speak with them over the entire length of the loan. Uh, and if you have to speak with them because something goes really bad and you can't pay your interest, it's tough because you don't know who your lenders are. And it probably bears no relation to who your lenders were when you, you first you know, borrowed the money. So. I think Covenant Light, while it's been a boom to issuers, I think in some ways it's been a self-correcting structure that has addressed the vast proliferation and syndication of loans out there. And if we had had covenants a lot of these loans, you would see exponentially more bankruptcies, which are, which are expensive, difficult, protracted, and usually value-destroying. So that's my view. You've had an, an, a slew of companies um, and I, I won't suggest whose portfolios have these, but uh, where they've done leverage recaps because there's no covenants protecting against restricted payments. And the inevitable result of not having a covenant that prohibits those kinds of restricted payments is a massive releveraging of the balance sheet followed by somebody loses a ton of money. And so I, I don't 
don't know. I think they're pretty valuable. But just remember, the, the leverage recaps of five or 10 years ago were hold co zeros, 12, 14%. They were equity. They were I'm mortgaging I'm talking two your years deal. ago. Huh? <laughs> and if you guys will loan us leverage recap money at 7%, we'll take it every day. I understand that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, you, you were talking about the, you know, the, the, the leverage door, the credit door closing yep. for certain companies, right? Lower grade credits right now. Yep. What happens when that window is no longer open to higher grade companies? Um, I mean, again, I think you just, you're facing the inevitable restructuring, and I think that's what the market's kind of moving towards. They're well, yes, that's on, the, uh, that's on the existing issuer side. Correct. What about somebody who's going to try and finance something? I mean, we don't know when this is going to happen, whether we're at 9 o'clock on the clock or later. At some point, right, we're going to pass midnight, and lots of companies are going to hit this refinancing wall. How then do you create a capital structure? What's it going to be akin to? What would you take it back to? Again, I think it's, it's hard to kind of generalize because I think in that type of environment, it becomes very creditor situation specific. And I think what Josh Harris was saying is, can, can you negotiate, bring in you know, other investors to kind of help delever, you know, in a sense, the transaction, at least that you're going to the public markets with. But again, at the end of the day, I think it has to be a viable and sellable story. And that's where, I, like I said, I, you know, from where we sit, there definitely the market has discriminated and differentiated, and there are definitely companies that are moving down that path of having to restructure. Is the that healthy? I think it, it is healthy. I think you know the you know the kicking the can down the road. You know the market is again getting to that point where you're just saying kind of we just don't see kind of you know late cycle. You know the, you know who's going to take us out? You know if the company's not going to be able to grow, you know or delever. You know, it's the greater fool theory. Who's going to show up? You know, when there is a maturity. So I think, I think that's healthy. That it's just the normal cleansing, uh, you know, that occurs in the market. And again, that greater discipline I think is healthy. You know, for you know for the market. So I think it's inevitability. Yeah, I mean, the, the wall maturities has largely been dealt with, and so the companies that are left with lots of debt that kind of they haven't paid back that have kicked the can and kicked the can and kicked the can. And there's a number of, you know, big names in the distressed and high yield market. You know, there's a day of reckoning uh, in some of these companies and the markets are now saying, you know, we kind of own this company. You know, we don't like what's going on necessarily. And, you know, we're not going to do that amend and extend. We're not going to uh, refinance that maturity. And, you know, each situation is different. Uh, well, Josh Creedman raised the, uh, the point about catalysts. It's not going to be the same for every company, but on a broader basis, what do you see being the catalyst for a turn? In well, I think uh, in terms of just the, the macro environment, or yeah, I mean the macro environment, you know, sort of no one knows, uh, but there are just a lot of things out there that could, you know, create issues. You know, I'd say certainly um, people are very focused on China, but I mean, like throw Japan in in that mix, like Japan. It's, it's, it's a difficult situation in Japan where um, there's a lot of debt uh, and the company, uh, the country is, you know, not, not really doing well. Um, I'd say certainly geo there are geopolitical events that could happen. And, you know, the one that people don't talk about is, you know, the U.S. could get inflationary. If the U.S. starts to get wage inflation and the Fed really has to raise rates, um, I think you'll see the dollar... Uh, respond, you know, by strengthening a lot, and so you could see a lot of pressure on the U.S. economy. And right now, the the Fed kind of has a free lunch. They can go very slowly about how they raise rates. And when you look at what happened between November and February, certainly oil was going down in China, but the Fed raised raised rates. They they got off of zero, and I think that had you know, a relatively significant effect on the market. So if the Fed starts to get into a situation where we start to see some inflation. Wages are moving up. It's slow. I think you could then see, you know, them f being forced into raising rates um, and really slowing our economy, which has been kind of the thing that's pushed the world forward a bit. And so slow growth could become no growth. And at that point, you know, you could have, you know, real terminal value issues on, the, on these capital structures. Let's end on this point. You're a capital provider. Jonathan, you can be a capital provider opportunistically. Josh, you're a capital provider. You see lots of capital providers. Is now the time to keep your powder dry? 
I, I think it's a time for caution. As I said, I think exposure to beta in the, in the high yield market is scary because beta really isn't, it, it's two different bets. It's the super leveraged things that look like a bit of a disaster on the triple C side that have run a lot in the last quarter, and it's the things that trade between 4 and 6% that are vulnerable to interest rates and spreads and credit deterioration. And when you take an environment of decreasing growth, and I'm not saying the economy is going to be a disaster by any means, but it's clearly an economy where if you look at growth revisions in almost every country, by the way, that, that is, that where, where these are tracked, they've all dropped. They've all dropped and continue to drop. So you have declining growth, you have technological innovation that's displacing companies, whether it's software companies, whether it's the cloud, or whether it's retailers that are getting uh, displaced, or whether it's uh, uh, any one of a variety of industries. Um, I, I think it's one where caution is merited. <laughs> but that being said, there's, there's been just enough yeah. disruption and roiling around that there seem to be a lot of different things trading at 10% or north to choose from much, much larger universe than there was four or five years ago. I think there's 1,300 credits as opposed to 400 credits trading at 10% or greater. That's a really different environment. So I think it's one where you should keep some powder dry. You should be very selective about what you should buy. And I'm not a lover of the index. Anybody else want a word before we wrap up? There's, no, there's very little alpha in the market today. It's all been, you know, kind of pushed out by zero rates. There's, you know, of the credits that Josh is talking about, like 80, something like 80% of them are natural resources and energy credits. So um, I think that, you know, you're fishing in a pond. You, you might be a very skilled fisherman, but you're, we're all fishing in ponds that don't have a lot of fish in them right now. So I think it is time to be cautious and, you know, go senior, Go, go lower return, you know, go for that extra two to 300 basis points, and then be very selective in the opportunistic markets and really where you have a big edge. Look at, uh, from our view, the world is a frightening place. If you go around the world in the Middle East and Russia and China and Asia, one country is more frightening than the other, and the least frightening is the United States. And we're doing the best here than anybody which is we're concentrating our investments. I think it's always a time for caution, but we're all in the business of investing. The beauty of the private equity model is we tend to, we, we have a fund structure, so we have dry powder when, when there's opportunity. If you're in a, a redemption type of, a product, whatever, you may not have the capital when there's opportunity. So we're always investing, but uh, our view continues to be if we find the growth, it, it will work out over time. But be cautious, you know, and take advantage of whatever opportunities Mr. Market is giving you in the credit markets to, to reduce your risks. And I, I Very quick add, last word uh, to you, yes. You know, I think what Josh had mentioned, I think it's, it's a market of credit, it's not a credit market. And probably the market wasn't as bad with the benefit of hindsight when high yield was at 10%. And I'm probably in the camp, it's probably not as good as, you know, it is, you know, closer to seven and a quarter. And I think with just, you know, the expectations we talked about, just what are the impact of regulation, market structure, there's going to be more volatility. And I think there will be more attractive entry points over, uh, over the course of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've learned something about how to turn lead into gold. Please join me in thanking Josh Friedman, Kerry Lathrop, Thanks, Josh. Josh Harris, and Jonathan Sokoloff. Thanks, Thank you.